Good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm very excited to talk to you about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, one that I wish I could claim credit for being solely my idea, but that's entirely not the case, as I believe is true for any good idea. I'm drawing on a lot of people who have spent a lot of energy doing this, and I'm very excited to share with you what I think can be a very powerful idea. That's musical diplomacy. Essentially, musical diplomacy means using music as a tool to enhance cross-cultural relations or cultural diplomacy. Practice makes power. You've heard the phrase, practice makes perfect, but what I'm going to be talking about today is diplomatic power, is soft power, political power, cultural power. Harnessing music as a tool to influence cultural power has been done before and can be do, done again. Now, I want to change our frame of mind around thinking about music and its universal applicability. A lot of people, many in this room, might be thinking of music as a universal language. I love that phrase. I happen to think it's true. But I also think it's become a little bit overused, and unfortunately, it's lost a little bit of its own power in, in doing so. I'd like to think of music as a fundamental tool. And I think if we think of it more that way, if we think of music as something that can be used to influence change, we start to realize that it has a lot more influence and impact and usability in a lot of different contexts. Not just a language that we think of as listening to, but a tool that we think of as using to influence relationships on a global scale. Let's take three realms as examples, science, science politics, and history. If we look at how music touches these realms, we start to see a little bit of how it, it gains its moniker of being a universal language and a universal tool. In science, there's no known culture in the history of the world that has lacked music, none whatsoever. That in itself is fairly remarkable. But on top of that, in many ancient cultures and some remaining today, the words that we think of for music and for dance are one and the same thing which is really interesting because it goes to show how music is not an innately isolated event. It's innately physical. It's innately communal. And we as humans have a distinct need for communal activity, for the connection of human to human. Music is one way we've done that historically in cultures across the globe since the beginning of time and certainly since the beginning of recorded time. So music is unique in its ubiquity and its antiquity, and there's never been a culture without it. Further, when we think about the cultural conditioning that happens with music, if you think about why you might prefer listening to a Chopin nocturne over, say, an Indonesian gamelan piece, that has very little to do with the actual content of either of those pieces. One is not inherently better than the other but it has very much to do with the exposure that you might have received before the age of five that may have led to you preferring listening to Chopin because it's comforting, because your mom may have played it on the piano, versus listening to an Indonesian gamelan piece that you don't even know what a gamelan is, much less how you would listen to it. So that's a little bit of the cultural conditioning that happens in the realm of music and science. Politics might not think about music and politics, but this is actually very fertile ground, not only in scholarly research, but in real life. Think about national anthems. If you sing a national anthem, what are you singing? Well, it's a pretty explicit representation of a nation's ideals or goals or values espoused in music. Almost every nation has one. Again, you're looking at cultural conditioning here because music can be used in political contexts to influence how people think about the values of a culture, how people think about the values of a government. And the government, in turn, can use music as a very powerful channel to express those ideas, to get people to be thinking about what those ideas mean in their daily lives. It can be very subtle, can be very overt. Historically, again, I'd love to to claim credit for this idea that music can be used in cultural diplomatic contexts, but it's been done before. The US was a pioneer in musical diplomacy as recently as the Cold War. It's really not that long ago. We used to send jazz musicians, Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, to Europe to play their music, jazz again being the, the, the cultural mode of the day, very popular, uh, to soothe tensions between the Soviet Union and the US. 
And by and large, these programs were very successful. Not only were these musicians icons at home and abroad, but what you saw as a result of these programs was not only do you have the very tense political discussions happening behind closed doors, which are very necessary, but you have these parallel programs, these concerts, these opportunities for musicians and audiences to mix and intermingle, and you start to learn a bit more about each other. There's no way, again, tying back to science a little bit, there's no way that you can listen to a piece of music and not have a reaction. It may be positive, it may be negative, but pretty much universally, you will have a reaction. So music has that ability to provoke a multifaceted response from an audience that you may not be able to predict and thus may not always be positive, but you know you're going to influence a conversation. You're, in other words, giving a fundamental sort of foundation for some kind of conversation to take place. And politically, scientifically, and historically, that's a very powerful idea. Now, the common thread that I've been talking about in these three realms, as an example, is cultural conditioning. Because essentially what I'm talking about is the parallel form of power that goes along with a nation's military and the armed forces and the traditional senses of power and politics that you might think of. What I'm talking about is opening up a channel for communication and for conversation that's less talked about and yet equally effective in different ways. And that's music and conditioning. So if we fast forward a little bit, let's talk about diplomacy. Diplomacy is a form of soft power. It's managing international relationships on a human level. So it's linking people to people and understanding what one group of, per of people might need and how you're going to achieve that. Very simplistically, it's getting other people to want what you want. How do you have a conversation with another person from another country who may not share a lot of the same cultural ideas, but you've been tasked by your government to have an effective and meaningful conversation and you want to demonstrate that you understand where the other person is coming from as well. Successful diplomats will be able to sit down and have that conversation and explain, here's where I'm coming from, here's why I'm coming from, from this perspective, I need to understand where you're coming from, and ultimately, we both need to leave this room feeling like we were successful. Right? But what you really see when you break that down is that there's a lot of theory involved. So, and as with any skill, a, a successful diplomat is going to have to go through a lot of training, and there's a lot of theory involved in that classroom. I am not a trained diplomat, so I'm not going to pretend that I know all of that theory, but I know a lot of people who are successful diplomats and have shared their experiences with me, and there's a lot of textbooks involved. There's obviously a lot of theory, as again, with any skill you're going to learn, you need to be able to, to put in the hours to understand what goes into being successful from a historical perspective. So diplomats are historians. Then there's the practice. There's the actual physical application of that theory outside of the classroom. Any successful diplomat will tell you that it really doesn't matter what you've learned inside the classroom if you can't apply it outside the classroom. So in real world contexts, what are you doing to actually affect meaningful change? What are you doing as a diplomat? You're working with people. It's a physical activity. It takes getting outside and working with people in practice to be any kind of effect. Now here's where it gets really interesting and where I'll bring us back to music. Any successful diplomat, again, will tell you that there's no possible way to script every situation you might be faced with. But many of them will be high stakes, high intensity, and incredibly difficult situations. And you might have a lot of theory in your back pocket, and you might have a lot of straightforward applications of that theory in field work and in research. But when you're faced all of a sudden with a conversation that you didn't predict, you need to be able to improvise. You need to be able to be faced with something that you never could have seen coming and say, okay, I got this. Here's what I need to do here. I understand where you're coming from on this level because one of those things I heard you say a few sentences ago was X, Y, Z. Let's play off of that and let's build on this, right? If you're not listening, you're never going to get there. And if you're not able to take those skills of theory plus practice, plus the comfort and ability and the confidence to go forward and say, gosh, I'm really just going to have to wing it on this. This is not something I practiced before. I'm not sure how to respond to you right now. What's that going to do, right? So of course you have to be able to improvise. You have to be able to stand up 
and get something done that you didn't see coming. Now, the overlap here with music is obvious, right? Because music's roots are communal, physical, and creative, and improvisatory. This is how music started. So the connection here is really interesting. I want to talk more about that. Arguably, the preeminent relationship of the 21st century is that between the US and China. It's certainly not new. There's a very storied history here. But I think in many ways, this bilateral relationship will define a lot of our diplomatic progress of this century, not to mention economic and otherwise. The history here is really interesting. The US, as I alluded earlier, has been very successful with cultural diplomatic programs using music since the Cold War and in other eras as well, but specifically the Cold War, when again, they sent Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie and others to soothe those tensions, remember. So we're kind of a dated champion when it comes to musical diplomacy. Unfortunately, while in the 50s and 60s we had this institutionalization of music and diplomatic programming, since then it's fallen out of favor. For plenty of good reasons, we've shifted focus to other parts of our diplomatic practices and we've evolved and we've innovated and we've done a lot of good things, but unfortunately musical programming hasn't been one of those things. And that's unfortunate because it's shifted music more to the periphery. It's become a little bit more of an accessory rather than the staple that it once was in our public diplomatic programming. When you look at China, there really doesn't come to mind a lot of Western classical music or jazz music, right? You don't, you don't tend to think of that, but in actuality, the piano popped up in China well over 100 years ago. In fact, we have documented evidence that the predecessor to the piano, the clavichord, was introduced in China as early as the 17th century. And what's really remarkable here is that one glance at the international stage today of classical musicians in particular will yield many Chinese faces. Long Long, Yun Di Li, Yu Jia Wang, many almost household names for anyone who listens to classical music on any kind of regular basis. Of course, there are many Europeans, there are many North Americans, there are many nationalities who are very famous. But what's remarkable is that the piano is not a native instrument to China. There are many stringed instruments that are native to China, like the arhu and others that I love, but the keyboard is not one of them. So they've es essentially imported these instruments, been introduced to these instruments, including the piano, and championed them. And what you see is that being a manifestation of China's institutionalization of classical music, specifically Western classical music, as sort of a symbol of their modernization project and their entry into a shared global culture. So what you have here is incredibly fertile ground for using Western classical music as the form of musical diplomacy, specifically in the US-China context, because it's a shared mode of an art form that's valued in both places. Now, for a lot of people, looking at music and talking about music is really nice. And most of us listen to music on a regular basis, so we understand why it's valuable. But in reality, when you talk about soft power, you really have to couple that with something to get the conviction from the policymakers and the people who provide the funding at the end of the day to understand why you need to do this. And that's where hard data comes in. So we can't just talk about why music is valuable and expect people to listen and all of a sudden start sponsoring trips again to China with musicians to put on concerts because, oh, well, we all love music and, and we share this music, so isn't that great? No, you've got to really put a lot of effort into this. And this is where I think the big idea has been stagnant. There hasn't been as much rigorous analysis and market research and data gathering and qualitative and quantitative studies done to demonstrate why music is so uniquely valuable in diplomatic contexts. And that's what we need to focus more on. So think about any multi-million dollar brand or multi-billion dollar corporation. They do this kind of research every day. Why did you like soda X over soda Y? Why did you choose candy bar A over candy bar B? Okay, we gotta go back and reformulate this soda because our market research tells us that people's feelings when they tasted it were much more positive than when they tasted this one. And by the way, people feel very strongly about this candy bar and not so much about this one. This is all I'm talking about. This is the kind of mindset we need to adopt in the analysis of music and its uses in cultural diplomatic contexts because that's the kind of frame of mind we need to be able to create the conviction in others, the decision makers at the end of the day, to be able to see the value here. 
And it's really right there. The raw ingredients for this are recording and documenting, measuring and analyzing. And you basically adopt that from what's already out there. From anyone who's had an internship with a, with a big company, you know, that's all it takes, obviously, at a much higher level and on a very deep scale. But the raw data is there. So I know, still, there are a lot of skeptics and maybe there are even some in this room or watching, and I'd love to talk with you. But it's not, the question comes up often, again, this is fleece blankets and unicorns. It sounds nice, but really, can you, can you affect any kind of change with music? We have to embrace the tough questions that are gonna come up. Can you really communicate a message without words? And how are relationships forged at the end of the day? And, well, you know, is this actually going to happen? Can this work? What does it mean to have progress? And a lot of tough questions will come up from this. How are you actually going to measure it? Who's going to perform it? Who's going to choose the pieces? How are you going to choose the pieces? The more we tackle these questions as musicians, as scholars, as the ambassadors, as diplomats, the quicker we will start to actually erase the ambiguity around these questions. It's just not, they're not going to go away, and there aren't concrete answers to every one of those questions. But if we think about it, music is powerful in itself. Most of us listen to it every day. You may listen to it when you're angry, and it makes you feel better, or it makes you feel more angry if that's what you're looking for. But chemically in your brain when you do that, things are changing. Music is changing the makeup of your brain in that moment, and for many moments, they're following. So we understand innately that music has this power, but we need to harness it. We need to harness it a little bit more carefully because there are a lot more contexts in which we can use it. And I think at the end of the day, this idea is really simple. The cultural conditioning that happens through music creates a channel for us to communicate with other people in ways we otherwise might not. And if we harness that power, the cultural conditioning that music allows, we're becoming better listeners, not just listeners of music, but listeners of each other. And that in itself is a very powerful idea. Thank you.